once again, would you open up that Bible? Let's take a closer look at Acts chapter 1. As Luke shares with us book 2, the sequel to book 1, which is the gospel Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, who you are named after, Lucas. <laughs> Let's take a look at how it starts out, Acts chapter 1. In the first book, and I want you to understand the enthusiasm here when he says, Oh, Theophilus, guess what I found out? I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Let me explain to you that the first book, the Gospel of Luke, was written by Luke. It is believed that Theophilus might have hired him or asked him to do this because there was a lot of rumors going around. There are a lot of things out there being said about Jesus, and he wanted to find a fact checker, a fact checker, and he found Luke. And Theophilus said, go and find out. Interview these people. Go to the locations. Let's get all the evidence and the proof together. I want to know if this is true. So in the first book, Luke is that detective. He's a doctor, and he's very professional about his work. And he begins with the birth of John the Baptist. He goes on to the birth of Jesus. And he, the, uh, uh, the time Jesus was baptized in the wilderness, and he also begins with a genealogy that goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, Adam and Eve in the garden. Because that's the first place that God begins his plan of salvation, forgiveness. He forgave Adam and Eve and made for them loincloths. Okay, and made a promise that someday the Messiah will come through Eve and he will crush the devil's head. Throughout the Old Testament, God is portrayed as the one who forgives An example of that would be Joseph. Remember, his brothers mistreated him, mocked him, threw him in a hole in the ground, sold him into slavery. He's basically assumed dead, but all of a sudden he's second in Egypt. After the drought, the children of Israel come down, and what does Joseph do with his brothers? Forgives them. Luke has Joseph in his lineage But throughout the book of Luke, that is the gospel, forgiveness is proclaimed again and again. And he really clarifies that the God we worship, his kingdom is of forgiveness, repentance and forgiveness. There's the woman you might remember who's a prostitute. She's crying and washes Jesus' feet. Pharisees, oh, how terrible, Jesus. Those who are forgiven much love much. Those who are forgiven little Love little. In that first book of Luke, Luke is the only gospel writer who emphasizes the prodigal son. That beautiful story of a son who mistreats the father and his brother and wastes the money, but when he comes to his senses through the Holy Spirit, he is forgiven and welcomed and a party is thrown for him. It is Luke who shows the forgiveness on the cross so clearly because Another son who doesn't do anything wrong. He too is mistreated by his brothers and sisters. He's thrown in a hole and he is crucified. And on the cross, it is Luke who shares these words of Jesus. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And it is Luke who shares that beautiful story of forgiveness on the cross where there are two thieves, both thieves and robbers, maybe even murderers. One wants to save himself. The other repents of his sins. And he says to Jesus, just remember me. And the most beautiful pronouncement of forgiveness and gospel. Today, you will be with me in paradise. Wow. Imagine how that thief fell, that eternal destination they had in common. And Jesus dies, rises on a third day, and for 40 days he visits his disciples, okay? And he finally gives them some commands, commands like this, 
Now listen, it has to be proclaimed that the Messiah, the Christ, had to die and rise on the third day. As the Old Testament proclaims in Isaiah and Jonah, it is Luke who gives the sign of Jonah three days. And then he says, and repentance and forgiveness has to be proclaimed, starting in Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. You see, in the Old Testament, everything is focused on Jerusalem and the coming of the Messiah. When they came out of Egypt with Joseph and Moses, they headed to the promised land, Jerusalem. When the children of Israel got there and they walked from God and they were carried off into captivity, where did they come back? To Jerusalem, rebuilt the temple and the wall. Everything is focused on Jerusalem. When Jesus came and died and rose, from that point on, everything focuses out from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Repentance and forgiveness must be proclaimed starting in Jerusalem to every nation. Now that's the first book. Luke gospel covers the first 30 years of the ministry of Jesus. It is Acts that Luke writes and covers the next 30 years of the bride of Christ, the church. Let's take a closer look. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. Verse 2, until that day, when he was taken up, after he had given commands, you know those commands, through the Holy Spirit. Notice how the Holy Spirit is acknowledged. To the apostles whom he had chosen. It is the apostles, the prophets and the apostles that give us the Bible. The foundation, one foundation of the church, as we sing, Jesus Christ is the foundation, but also the word made flesh or the word of God is a foundation of the church. Jesus is our foundation. The word of God that proclaims Jesus is our foundation. Verse 3, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering. By many proofs, one thing that separates Christianity from other religions on the earth is all the proof, all the eyewitness, all the documentation, all the cities, all the locations that are proven. Christianity is based upon eyewitnesses who were there and bore witness. And then all the things that Jesus Christ did that no other person has done. Many proofs. Appearing to them during 40 days. Now notice this. I want you to catch this word, speaking. That's simply speaking about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God according to God, not mankind. The kingdom of God that proclaims repentance and forgiveness. Because you see, people are looking for that purpose and that identity and that whole being filled in their life. Whether you know it or not, Jesus has put eternity in the hearts of every man, woman, and child. And he's the only one that can fill that eternity, that place. And so speaking about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is talking about things that people do want to hear, whether you believe that or not or know it or not. Because people are looking for identity. They are looking for purpose. They want to know... Is there more than this? Think about those disciples. What Jesus died in before he rose from the dead. They might have been thinking, now what? What's next? And there's this beautiful answer. And there's people like that today. Verse 4. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, Notice this, the Father is mentioned. Which he said, you heard from me. That's Jesus speaking. And then verse 5, for John baptized you with water. But you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
I want to point this out. The foundation of the Christian church is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's our God. In the book of Acts, it's clearly explained. It is the Father who sent the Son, and it is the Son who sent the Holy Spirit. Whenever we do a confession in the church, whether it's the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or any creed we put up on that screen and say together, there's three articles that proclaim Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The name mentioned when you were baptized. That is the foundation of the Christian church. Now, what is mentioned here is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, a lot of people try to, wait, wait, I was baptized, and what's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? It's God's process of changing your colors, okay? Flip one page with me, back to John 20, verse 22. Jesus died, he rose from the dead, he meets with the disciples, okay? Okay? The disciples who had the work of the Holy Spirit in their life. No one can say Jesus is Lord except through the Holy Spirit. Remember that cloth I dipped in the dye and a process was started. The Holy Spirit was given. And he begins to, if I dare say, erase part of your life and immerse your life with himself. It's a process. It doesn't happen immediately or it could. But for the disciples, it took three years. They were baptized. Jesus was baptized through the baptism of John for repentance. Now, Jesus, of course, didn't need that, but a process began. And here, Jesus dips him again in the power of the Holy Spirit. This is before Pentecost, verse 22, John 20. And when he had said these things, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. They already had the Holy Spirit. But they receive more of the Holy Spirit, more drenching of the Holy Spirit, because the goal is to be immersed in the Holy Spirit, completely drenched, covered by the Holy Spirit. It's not that we immerse ourselves. It is that the Holy Spirit immerses himself in us. Notice this. Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. And if you withhold the forgiveness, forgiveness from any it is withheld it's all based upon forgiveness what separates christianity the foundation of christianity is we are forgiven and we forgive that's what we pray in the lord's prayer back to acts verse six so when they had come together they asked him lord will you at this time Restore the kingdom of Israel. These poor disciples are still going from their sinful nature. Okay, and thinking, oh, now now is God going to come? Are you going to come? And are we going to have the authority and judgment against those Romans? You can just see Jesus shaking his head. And Dr. Spomer last week spoke to us about Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey the foal of a colt of a donkey, gentle, humble, a suffering servant. But Dr. Spomer also reminded us someday he's going to come as a white stallion and he's going to come as judge. We confess that in the Apostles' Creed and he will come again to judge the living and the dead with the power of judgment, okay? And Jesus acknowledges, yeah, that's coming. Notice how he does it, his second coming. He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. That's coming. But until then, there is a different power, not judgment, but a forgiveness that I'm going to give you and I'm going to immerse you in. And when you're finally immersed and drenched with the Holy Spirit, I'm going to send you out. Notice what happens. Verse 8, but you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and I'm going to emphasize this, fully immerses you and drenches you. And the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem. Now, of course, this took after three years of soaking those disciples. You will be my witness in Jerusalem. And in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, you notice from Jerusalem out, 
to the ends of the earth. Now, through the power of the Holy Spirit, the church has to go out. Old Testament, everybody coming into Jerusalem. New Testament, everybody going out to the ends of the earth. That's God's grand story, his plan of salvation for all nations. Then verse 9, and I'm going to paraphrase as I read this. Please forgive me, but this is how I see it. And when Jesus had said these things, he drops the mic. (laughs) As they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. Wow. What do we learn from this? What can we take home? Well, the foundations of the church, first and foremost, The church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, the Lord. Another foundation of the church is the word of God that we boldly proclaim at every service here at a place. We know it's the Holy Spirit that has worked through the prophets and the apostles to give give us this written word. And we know the command of Jesus Christ that we have to tell people, and speak to people that the Messiah, the Christ, that God had to suffer and die and rise on the third day. But repentance and forgiveness must be proclaimed to the ends of the earth, beginning in Jerusalem. Why? Because people need to hear that. Because deep inside, people are struggling with their own sin. Struggling with eternity. Is there anything more? What is identity? What is my purpose? And when Jesus called the disciples, he has called us, but he has also empowered us. It is a process that begins at your baptism and throughout your training. And eventually, someday what happens, you emerge from this process with new humanity a new Adam and a new Eve. And what happens is you finally realize that I commune with the Spirit of God. I have the Spirit of God within me, and I do have a purpose. I do have identity. It's the church. It's Him. And when you are fully ready, immersed with the Holy Spirit, He sends you out to be a witness for him. Now, I'm going to give you a Greek word. I don't like doing this, but today is one of those exceptions. You will be my witness. Now, the Greek word for that, you may or may not recognize, but you ready? I'll give it to you. Martyris. Martyris. You recognize the English word? Martyr. What he's basically saying to each and every one of us, I'm sending you out to be a martyr. Hmm. But I've empowered you. You have been baptized with the Holy Spirit, totally drenched. And I'm sending you in that power because you now have the identity. Your color has changed. You are a new person in Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit. Let me put it in a way that will help you. You have more in common as a Christian sitting here or online this morning than you, you, you have more in common as a Christian with a Christian in South Africa who's a Christian, someone who knows that the chains have been removed, Someone who also sings, you might say, in their heart, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Make me more aware of your presence than you have in common with somebody in Tulsa, Oklahoma, or a broken arrow who doesn't know Jesus. You have more in common with a Christian believing homeless person than you have in common with somebody you're working with today that doesn't know Jesus. You have more in common with a Christian in Russia or China 
than you have in common with someone who's of your same political bent or party that doesn't believe in Jesus. And now I'm going to get real serious here. You have more in common with a Christian in South America than you have if you're an OSU fan or an OSU fan and with somebody who's the same fan base as you but is not a Christian. Because you have somebody whose chains have been lost, who welcomes the Holy Spirit, who's been changed. The color of him and her has been changed by the work of the Holy Spirit. And here's the proof. Your eternal destination. You have heaven in common. What does a murdering thief, dying, have in common with the... Savior of the world, God Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. You know what they have in common? Eternal destination. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. We have the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the faith, and the self-control in common with Christians throughout the world. And this is what Martin Luther in the small catechism is trying to bring out to the people who read it and study it in the Apostles' Creed, first, second, and third article. We confess, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. That's part of speaking of God's kingdom. Listen to how Martin Luther And hopefully, if you have a catechism, you'll go back to it someday. Listen to his meaning of the third article. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me. He has sanctified and has kept me in the one True faith, the drenching again and again until you're fully immersed. And he keeps me in the one true faith. But Martin Luther doesn't stop there. He goes on. In the same way, he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it in the one true faith in Jesus Christ. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on. And daily, he richly, forgives my sins and the sins of all believers. Then he even goes on a little farther and says, someday he'll raise me from the dead along with all believers. (laughs) The same eternal destination. (laughs) What is the foundation of the church? Jesus, the word of God, the proclamation of repentance and forgiveness. But here's the big one, folks, for you to take home. The foundation of the church is you. If a block is laid on a foundation, it becomes one with the foundation. You have been laid on a foundation as living stones. You are a martyr for Christ, a witness. And as you leave, I want you to think about this. How's your witness? Your witness is how you speak about Christ, the kingdom of God, how you live your life. Are you one with the spirit of God? Do you realize you're completely been changed? You're a different color. You're a different person. And you have power. As part of the foundation of the church to speak, to share, to witness. (laughs) I hope you'll think about that. Not only do you need to do it individually as a person, but we need to do it corporately as a church. How are we doing? Are we being effective in our witness? Is there things that we're really good at or are there things we can be 
better at. We need to always consider that as we remember, we too are part of the foundation of the church. Because we've gone out from Jerusalem. And we need to go and reach to the ends of the earth. May we never forget the foundations of the church. It begins with the Holy Spirit. And it ends with the Holy Spirit taking us to heaven. <laughs> I tell you, it starts in your baptism. And hopefully you're fully drenched with the Holy Spirit. And my prayer is that we'll go forth and share the good news. Amen.